رايت صباح الخير للجميع مرحبا بكم مرة أخرى في اليوم الثاني لفعاليات المؤتمر الثالث لتعلم اللغة العربية وتعليمها في التعليم العالي في المملكة المتحدة هذه الدورة الثالثة يستضيفها مؤتمر مؤتمر معهد الدراسات العربية والإسلامية في جامعة إكسيتر يوم أمس كان يوم موفق جدا الحمد لله من حيث عدد الحضور ونوعية الأبحاث المشاركة ومن اللافت للنظر إنه الحضور كان من جميع أنحاء العالم حقيقة يعني المؤتمر يبدو مؤتمر عالمي بالفعل اليوم نواصل معكم البرنامج من محاضرات نوعية حتبدأ بضيفتنا العزيزة جدا جيتنا من أبوظبي الدكتورة ليلى حتسمعوها بعد خمس دقائق وفي عندنا كمان أوراق بحثية أخرى وفي عندنا ورش عمل وطبعا طبعا إضافة إلى مسابقة المؤتمر التي لاقت إقبالا كبيرا أمس أرجو أن تتابعوا معنا جلسات اليوم وأن تشاركوا في المسابقة التي نقدمها في الساعة الأخيرة من المؤتمر لأنها تحوي أسئلة من الأبحاث المقدمة في المؤتمر جوائز المسابقة هي أجهزة لوحية تابلت هي ترجمتي إن شاء الله تكون كويسة مقدمة من مؤسسة قطر العالمية قطر فاونديشن مشكورة جدا الجوائز سترسل إلى عناوين الفائزين بعد المؤتمر حتوصل إلى عنوانكم في أي بلد أنتم موجودين فيه قبل أن أختم حديثي أود باسم اللجنة التنظيمية أن أعتذر للزملاء اللي تحدثوا أمس ولم يسعفنا الوقت بتقديم سيرتهم الذاتية بالتفصيل إحنا آسفين يعني كان الوقت ضيق جدا أتمنى على الجميع أن يعودوا إلى كتاب المؤتمر للاطلاع على السيرة الذاتية لكل متحدث لأنها أكيد سيرة ذاتية ثرية جدا شكرا جزيلا للجميع أتمنى لكم يوم سعيد ومثمر والآن الشير رئيسة الجلسة هي سوسن خليل دكتورة سوسن أستاذة دكتورة في جامعة كامبريدج في قسم الدراسات الأسيوية والشرق الأوسطية في جامعة كامبريدج تفضلي سوسن إليك الميكروفون Um, shukran ya abla. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be chairing the session and to be introducing our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Leila Familiar, uh, joining us from New York University in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Leila Familiar is senior Arabic lecturer at New York University in Abu Dhabi and academic consultant at the American Councils for International Education. She has an MA in teaching Arabic as a foreign language and a PhD in Corpus Linguistics for the Design of Reading Materials. She's project manager of Khalina, the editor of two abridged novels for students of Arabic, and the author of a frequency dictionary of contemporary Arabic fiction. Um, it's my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce you, Alayla. Really looking forward to your keynote speech today. The title is Reimagining Teacher Education and the Arabic Classroom, what happens when teachers believe in their own freedom of choice and vulnerability. Over to you, Yalayla. Thank you so much, Sosan, for this uh, presentation. And the honor is really mine to be with you all here today. Um, I enjoyed very much yesterday's, uh, the first day of the conference. Uh, and so really thank you to the University of Exeter and the organizers for inviting me and and, and for making the event free, I think this is this is great too. Um, should I share my screen now? Yes, please. Yep. Leila, you are muted. Okay, now, yes, thank you. Okay, all sounds good? Yes. Perfect. So I'm going to be talking about teachers today, about our role in the classroom, in shaping what happens um, in our teaching, specifically at um, agency and its impact on the curriculum that we choose uh, to use and the kind of classroom communities 
that we build as a consequence of the choices we make. At the beginning of my talk, I'm gonna share with you what I think is the teaching model that is often implemented in the teaching of Arabic as a second language, why it doesn't serve us very well and where we can find some answers. Throughout the talk, I'm gonna um, ask for voluntary participation uh, through the chat at the beginning of my presentation and at the end. Uh, and the rest of the time, please feel free to, to participate through the chat and interact as, as you wish, as you like. I'm gonna look uh, at that at, at the end today. But before we start, let me ask you something. Let me see if my keyboard works. No. Is it moving? Yes, I hope so. Yeah, we're on the next slide, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, let me ask you if you remember the very first time you taught Arabic. Do you remember the course, um, the semester, that very first year that you taught Arabic? Um, does any of these images come to mind for you? And if so, write in the chat what image comes to you. If not, maybe something else comes to mind. Describe that image, describe the, the picture whatever it is. Okay, gonna give a few seconds here. These are just some of the choices. So again, if you have something else in mind, just reflect on that for a moment. And then I'm gonna bring you back to the present and ask you, how is that going? Has anything changed for you? How does teaching now compare to the first time teaching a course? Again, select one image or describe whatever image um, comes to mind for you or think about it. Maybe you want to write it down on, on a piece of paper. For me, when I reflect on my teaching experience, to be honest, many images come to mind. But that very first course that I gave, 20 years ago, I was completely lost. At the time, I was teaching uh, Spanish at the Instituto Cervantes in Cairo, and I was asked to design a course of Arabic for my um, teacher colleagues, and everyone thought it was a great idea since I'm bilingual. Um, the idea sounded exciting for me too, but I hesitated a lot. Now, long um, story short, um, I end up accepting, but once I start preparing the course, I feel at loss. Where should I start from? What textbook? Should we learn Egyptian dialect or should we do MSA? Um, I was given absolute freedom by the administrators, but I was pretty, pretty scared. That course, <laughs> I ended up teaching a song by Abdul Halim Hafiz and one by Ahmad Adawiya. It was an a low advanced class maybe. We had a lot of fun. I think I have a witness in the room today, uh, my friend Marta. But the course really had no solid structure, no clear outcomes. I would spend a lot of time preparing worksheets so I can introduce uh, some you know, meaningful input to my um, student colleagues. But I wasn't really sure where was I heading. Sometime after that, I start teaching at a different program and this time with a textbook. Okay, and so I was extremely excited and happy, relieved, because the textbook would save me a lot of time until I start using the textbook. This was an MSA textbook where lessons started with a dialogue and new vocab was supported by images, as you can see here, to facilitate comprehension. And it was a little bit different from the textbooks that I was used to when teaching Spanish. The dialogue um, um, would be followed by, you know, some, um, some mechanical drills, activities, matching exercises, fill in the blanks, stuff like that. Um, eventually a reading passage with some comprehension questions, um, some grammar typically as well. And then the lesson would end with a set of pictures so that students could use um, the new vocab and grammatical structures uh, somehow freely to, to describe um, those pictures as you know, and, and the grammar they, they just learned. And every lesson 
was exactly the same. And about once a month, I would be asked by the administrators, where are you in the textbook? Which lesson did you reach? So from, from being completely lost, I was now feeling that I was chained to a textbook. It was, it was an extreme shift for me. From having all the agency of the word, now, which is not ideal for a beginner teacher, that was my case at least, to feeling that I was chained to a book that I had to use and a book that I was accountable for, right? Now that was 20 years ago. Um, and although we use different textbooks today, many teachers report feeling um, constrained by a curriculum that follows a very similar model in the way in which lessons are introduced to students. So what is this model? If we look closely at um, mainstream Arabic textbooks, specifically at the way lessons are organized and the way we transfer that into our classrooms, we find that basically um, they replicate the same formula. And the formula is you present the input, typically through a predetermined uh, vocab list or a text and some vocab. Um, you do some controlled practice using um, that vocab list um, repetition, fill in the blanks, dictation, um, writing sentences. Then we do some semi-controlled practice, like describing a picture, read the text and answer questions. We compare my city with the city of the classmate, etc. And then towards the end of the lesson, maybe, maybe, that's why you, you see the question mark, um, students engage in what is called free practice, because it's not always included in the textbook. And it's typically left out to the teacher to design and implement if they want, if they have the time to, we, we will discuss the reasons uh, afterwards. So as you know, um, what I just described is called the PPP um, lesson model. It's presentation, practice, production. And it first appeared um, with a situational approach for teaching languages in the 60s. This model assumes that language is composed by a discrete set of uh, items that need to be practiced in, you know, in a specific order in order to, to be proficient in the language. Um, and of course, it assumes that learning happens in a linear fashion. And, and this was the 60s again. Then um, in the 70s, this model was incorporated into um, the communicative approach. Um, and so basically the situational approach and the communicative approach that is currently implemented in my opinion in the field of TASL basically follows a, a phrasebook approach to syllabus design. As Scott Thornberry says in, in, in this quote, nothing much has changed from uh, the 60s until this, you know, to the 70s and until now the communicative approach, if, if we assume that's, that, that's what we're using now in our classrooms, then we're just giving students some more, you know, opportunities to talk in class basically. But the model is the same. Of course, some will say, what's the problem with a PPP based curriculum, right? After all, it follows a skills-based approach, um, it works. Students can achieve good results in the tests. Um, some of them can even show fluency. So what's really problem with this kind of curriculum? If we agree that there is a great deal of PPP-based um, instruction in our field, I wonder then to what extent this is a rigid and predictable curriculum. Every lesson, every week, every unit looks exactly the same. Students know that will start studying um, this vocab list, that will memorize it, will practice predetermined um, structures, uh, that will read a passage, answer some questions, engage in conversations that have nothing to do with my life as a student. This is feedback we hear from them uh, in many Arabic programs, not only uh, beginner students, by the way, but advanced students as well report the same feeling and it's boring for them. And then because language is understood as a set of discrete items that we need to practice over and over before reaching competency, 
then busy work is required. And I'm using the term busy work because it's an expression that we often see in students' evaluations. I've seen it in my students' evaluations. And it's also a complaint that teachers make when discussing the issue of grading. There are lots of mechanical drills that students have to do, and someone, of course, has to grade them, right? If you think about it, um, this model of language instruction is typically implemented in uh, what we call achievement-based programs. This means that instead of focusing on uh, what proficiency actually means for Arabic, uh, we work on making students learn what's in the textbook so they can pass the exam, uh, which again is, is almost also standardized across programs. I'm not gonna enter into discussing um, what does proficiency means for Arabic because that's a whole different conversation, but I think it should be uh, in the back of our minds. So in, in achievement-based programs, basically what happens is that teachers have very little room uh, to bring anything different from the classroom, whether it's a text or an activity, um, in fact, whenever I give a workshop or a webinar on the use of literature or how to integrate culture into the language classroom, the first concern we hear and the teachers raise is, how can I do that? I don't have time to do that. I have to cover X amount of lessons in my textbook. From a curricular um, standpoint, um, textbooks that follow this model oftentimes are depersonalized or dehumanized um, the main objective is to learn a set of vocab, these grammatical structures. And so they do not include text or images that are cognitively or effectively engaging. We don't have to do that under this model actually. And even the questions that come with text are designed in a way that promote information reproduction. And this generates, as you know, a very particular kind of conversations inside the classroom, which I'll talk about um, in a minute. <clears throat> in reality, this model of language education is based on what is called in the literature scripted instruction. And under this model, teachers are basically viewed as technicians whose job is to implement the curriculum provided by the textbook. Now, if you're still listening, then I invite you to explore with me some paths that can help us as teachers think outside this model because we are in a very complex and difficult situation, in my opinion, um, a situation as well that has far reaching implications for the field. Um, it's impacting, for example, our hiring practices and the model of teacher training we often provide. Um, so how can we think outside this model? Part of the answer um, to this question, I think, is to be found in the CEFR, the Common European Framework um, of Reference for Languages. And the answer comes in rethinking what does language mean in the context of our profession? How do we view language as teachers of Arabic? Because if we view language as a vehicle for communication, rather than a subject to study and get tested on, if we really believe in this, we must revisit much of the curricula that we currently use. And then we should answer a second question, which is, what does communication mean? How do I understand communication? If we look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the first definition is not very helpful for our profession, but the first sub-definition could be at least it's a good starting point. If you think about the type of exercises we do in the classroom, we have a lot of activities where students have to exchange information, right? Um, all Arabic textbooks include, as far as I know, talk to your classmate, well, not all, but I mean, mainstream textbooks, talk to your classmates, ask your classmates, these kind of exercises. The question is, is that genuine communication, real? authentic dialogic communication, or is it maybe pseudo communication? Do students have the urge to voice their opinion when they read a text or see a picture in the textbook? Do they feel excited? Are they really eager to voice their opinions? I don't know about you, but sometimes, sometimes I have the feeling that language students produce in class is a monologue 
more than a dialogue. So if this is the case, how can we promote communication that is real, authentic? Again, um, part of the answer is in the Sefer. 20 years ago, the Sefer advocated for an action-oriented approach to teaching and learning languages um, because they saw the learner as a social agent, someone who has um, a responsibility in society and also in the learning process, as they later uh, explain. And this is not only an empowered vision of the learner, but it sheds light really on the human side of students. Uh, it sees the student as a person who has and should exercise their individual agency when learning a second language. But what is agency? Although research published on this notion is considerable, um, especially in the field of sociology and education, um, scholars warn us that the use um, of this concept is, uh, and its definition, is slippery, complex, tricky, even a black box. Some scholars even say that it's useless really to define the term because we won't agree and we will find contradictions among our definitions. As you know, this concept also um, occupied um, um, philosophers for centuries. Um, and more recently in the field of psychology, we see it also often discussed. Later on was scrutinized by sociologists, education psychologists, even psychiatrists. Um, and if you read the literature, you'll find multiple synonyms to the term. What's interesting also is that the concept of agency or autonomy is often linked to another concept, which is responsibility. The responsibility that comes with the exercise of autonomy or individual choice. Um, this, the issue of what, when we talk about, and the Sefer does this too, when we talk about agency, the first, time, the first thing that typically comes to mind is student agency in specific. And this has actually become a very important theoretical construct in, in second language acquisition. And um, you see here three definitions. What I want to highlight is that oftentimes scholars focus on the concept of uh, students' self-efficacy in regulating their learning. Um, and this effort tells us that teachers need to offer mediation and scaffolding opportunities for learners to reach their goals. But we seldom explicitly reference or make any reference to anything that's related to the emotional or affective side of agency. On the other hand, teacher agency has, hasn't been explored um, as much as a student agency, but um, uh, the concept is also not mentioned in the Sefer, but there is a growing interest in the notion and how it manifests in teaching. And this is good news and very necessary in our field if we want to understand the uh, current landscape of, of, uh, of teaching Arabic as a second language, what happens in the classroom, the kind of conversations we have, the kind of relationships we have with our students as well, and even the repertoire of cultural and linguistic competencies that students end up um, having. As I said a minute ago, the Sefer doesn't mention explicitly the term teaches agency, but it says that empowering students to become agents in the learning process requires a real paradigm shift in both course planning and teaching, which means that the curriculum that we use or bring to the classroom has a direct impact on students' agency. And I wanna go one step further and make the claim that students won't be able to enact their agency unless teachers enact theirs. In other words, teachers have to first exercise agency before making students fully responsible for succeeding in the learning of Arabic. On the slide, I have the famous um, Arabic saying, which roughly translates as, um, um, we can't give something to another if we don't have it ourselves. So how is that? I'm going to share with you two professional experiences that have helped me personally understand the importance of exercising my own agency when making curricular choices. 
and um, its impact on classroom dynamics, on the quality of conversations we have with our students. And um, the first experience comes um, from my work with Khalina. As some of you know, it's an open source website that contains um, pedagogical modules to teach um, Arabic through the lens of culture. It includes uh, modules that target novice, intermediate and advanced learners. Um, if you have some time after the conference, I definitely invite you to um, explore it. Um, but let me tell you that uh, what I learned um, about agency from working on this project. This project um, was born about 10 years ago when a group of undergraduate uh, graduate students and I, um, back when I was teaching at the University of Texas, realized that students of Arabic weren't especially um, excited about the texts and activities we were bringing to class. We had a feeling um, that students were looking for something um, different, a different kind of text, something that could bring them um, a bit closer to Arab cultures um, and something that resonated with them personally. So we started engaging this group of undergrad and graduate students and I in a series of informal conversations. And we would meet to discuss and imagine what kind of curriculum or textbook we would love to see one day. And we had an idea of what kind of topics would probably be successful in class, but before developing anything seriously, we thought, let's ask students, you know, what they really like to see. So we designed a survey, um, we sent it to a few language programs uh, that teach Arabic in the US. Um, I think mainly they were the flagship programs. And we get an idea of the topics that students um, wanna discuss in class. Once we have an idea, we start developing our first module, which is about a Lebanese music band called Mashroor Layla and um, the idea of alternative music in the Arab world. It was very successful. So what we do is that we then start developing other modules. Um, everything that we were piloting, honestly, was receiving, um, we, we were receiving positive you know, feedback from students. And so um, something was telling us that this kind of curriculum could have a lot of potential. So eventually we send a sample to Qatar Foundation and uh, we obtain our first grant. Um, and today, thanks also to funding from NYU uh, in Abu Dhabi, we have 18 modules on the website, authored by 14 different people, uh, and often in collaboration. And those who have used the material, to be honest, whether students or teachers report positive feedback um, for various reasons. In my case, I'll tell you that the first time that I saw qualitative change um, um, in classroom dynamics, in students' attitudes, um, in students' evaluations even, occurred really when I used these materials as my full fourth Arabic um, semester. It was, and this is a strange when I think about it, it was as if I was teaching a different language. It reminded me of when I was teaching Spanish in Cairo, for example. So I want to thank from here everyone who uh, have contributed to the project, to the vision, to the design, to the piloting, to the implementation. Now, why does this um, kind of material work? Based on my experience and the experience of others, one of the reasons why it works is because it speaks to the needs and wishes of students. When the curriculum resonates with students' interests, the kind of classroom community that you build is different. You start having real conversations, conversations about things that matter to students and to us as teachers, hopefully as well. So the goal, now for students is not to master this, you know, vocab list or these grammatical structures. It, it's about talking about something that I like in class. Um, here you have, um, uh, we have, here you have one testimonial from a student I had here in NYU Abu Dhabi a couple of years ago. Um, we, we have very few testimonials on the website, I want to say, and that I did a bad job there. Um, but what you see on the slide is genuine feedback. And I just want to highlight a couple of things that we keep hearing from students. They say these are interesting discussions, both linguistically and intellectually. And they say that the learning experience is more exciting and memorable than traditional textbook approaches. 
So what did I learn from working on this project in regards to agency? I learned that guided agency and critical dialogue are very powerful in guiding our educational practices. It's essential that we seek students' feedback. And I heard that yesterday. I was very happy to hear it. We need their feedback and their guidance in a way. And it's also very important that we discuss curricular issues with like-minded colleagues. It's a must really, I cannot emphasize this enough for anyone who wants to work on curricular design and development. And I know it's many of you here today. These two elements, students and curriculum, cannot be disconnected. Otherwise, we would be designing um, textbooks and curricula that um, speak to us as teachers, not to students. Um, how, how can I translate this in, in my classroom? I can do a survey at the beginning of, of my semester. Uh, why are you in this class? What do you want to learn? What kind of topics? What language registers you're interested in? This is like the, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room. What, do, you, do you prefer learning a dialect or MSA? Um, and sometimes it's difficult to make this question. It's, it's not about me only sometimes. But again, there are many different ways of involving students on the curricular um, choices that we make. This is what I learned from my first experience. The second experience starts um, when at some point in my career I begin observing that um, certain reading passages that um, I bring to the classroom are extremely challenging and frustrating for students and that maybe, maybe they aren't as helpful as they should be in advancing um, students' reading skills. And when you're a beginner teacher, um, oftentimes um, you tend to doubt yourself. Um, you think, oh, maybe I'm not using the text the right way. Maybe I'm asking the wrong questions. Um, I might even refrain from sharing my classroom failures with colleagues to seek help and advice, alternatives. And when we work under PPP, uh, uh, based language programs, as I describe them, um, when we use this kind of curriculum, and especially, uh, uh, Rasha uh, avoided yesterday talking about the workload, but I'm gonna talk about workload a little bit, because when we are in programs where classes meet four and five times a week, we tend to operate on autopilot. I know exactly how this feels, and I know that many of you do too. There's only time to prepare for class, to teach, and to grade. And when this happens, we also tend to put aside everything we've learned in grad school or in our, you know, dissertation, PhD dissertation, or anything we've learned in a workshop, in a conference from personal readings, anything that has to do with SLA, we put it aside because there are different priorities now. The program has different priorities now. And here I want to reflect out loud like, and ask you, how many times have you attended a workshop or read an article, loved an idea, and told yourself, I'm going to try this out in class? And then the moment never comes because you're caught up again in the same, you know, work dynamic. It, it happens to me all the time. And it's easy to forget what we know about second language acquisition when we're on autopilot. It's easy to feel that we don't have time uh, to do something different. Uh, something that we suspect might work better or something that we like personally as teachers, you know. Um, and when we are in that mental space, experimenting with new approaches to teaching Arabic requires a huge effort. It's not easy and there are oftentimes obstacles. But let me tell you that there is always something and a moment that helps you escape the hamster wheel, as I call it even if it's for a very short period of time. Uh, and I know, and I'm very happy to see that many language programs today are, are doing very innovative um, things and they're creating their, their own curriculum really based on, on students' needs. For me, the moment I escaped the hamster wheel was when I read a short story by the great author, uh, Taib Saleh. Um, it was Hifn al as you can see on the slide. And I've, I thought to myself, 
Um, this is this is a nice story. It makes a great reading passage for my second year students. It's a bit difficult. Let me simplify it a little bit so they can read it. And so I do that. I design very basic activities. I assign the text as homework. And the next day, the discussion turns out great. Huge success in class. Something about the themes of the story um, provoked a different kind of conversation that day. And my own excitement, of course, of doing something different uh, contributed to students' engagement. So because I saw that success, Next year, I teach again second year and I discuss with some colleagues the possibility of using the same text across all four sections of second year. We do that, we follow it by a brief survey uh, and we discover that students love reading literature when it's accessible to them. And let me tell you from there, one thing starts leading to another. I start reading research about the benefits of reading literature in the language classroom because I had the curiosity. I had observed a few things happening in class, classroom dynamics, students' reactions, kind of conversations, and I wanted some confirmation from research. And I get that confirmation. Sometime later, I come across, and, and, and I'm doing something similar to what to what Rasha did yesterday. I'm, I'm kind of walking you through, through, through my evolution as a teacher. Because after that experience of bridging a, a simple story, um, I come across the term extensive reading. Huda Barakat happens to come to our program. Uh, I abridged her novel. I piloted twice with different groups. And then I send it to Georgetown University Press. It gets published. Then I learn about the term um, lexical frequency and how it's essential in developing effective reading skills. And I take it into consideration, let me tell you, when I abridge Sakal Bamboo. Um, um, and after this project, um, I finish my PhD and I decide that I wanna do a frequency dictionary so that we can develop a full series of graded readers for students of Arabic, of Arabic. Not only you know novels for advanced students, but something for the novice learners, for intermediate learners, because I keep hearing that the demand. Now, as you can see, it took me years, many, many years to discover why the texts that I was bringing to class were not helping my students develop reading fluency or efficient reading skills, at least at the level that uh, we wanted. It was simply because the students were being exposed to large amounts of vocab that was unfamiliar to them. Uh, texts included all the time vocab that was not particularly frequent in Arabic. Um, and lexical frequency happens to be one of the most important things when acquiring second languages. Not only reading skills, but even, you know, listening, oral spoken skills. Um, what you see in the screen is the cover of my next work. Inshallah, we will see it in the market next month. It's a frequency dictionary where um, you'll find the top 2000 words that occur in contemporary Arabic fiction. And I'm very excited about the potentials um, of, um, of this dictionary. So What's the lesson that I learned this time um, about agency? If with Khalina I learned that we need to involve students when making curricular choices, this time I learned that for agency to have real impact, we need to exercise principled agency. When agency is not informed by research, when it's simply based on personal preferences, it can work in the classroom, I have to say. After all, good teaching is not about um, the curriculum only. It's also about teachers, we all know that. But I might not help students successfully in what they need to be learning at specific stage. And it also might not have a larger impact in the field or in convincing other colleagues that this is, you know, this is a good approach to teaching Arabic. And I'm, I'm saying this because if you're doing something interesting that's working in your classes and you have good reasons to believe that it has a sound foundation, I encourage you to do some action-based research. Um, something that's easy, simple, doesn't have to be very complicated. Consult with colleagues, share with them the idea and take your work to the next level because we really need more diversity in the kind of curriculum 
um, that we offer to our students. And as I said a minute ago, there are, there are very good initiatives happening um, these days in the field of Arabic, and I'm, I'm very optimistic. I shared um, with you these two stories, not um, to convince you that you need to use Khalina or simplified literature in your classes. You might not even like literature yourself, and that's totally fine. I shared this experience um, to tell you what I, um, what I learned about agency and to tell you that the behaviors that we display in the classroom, including the curriculum that we use, is not a coincidence. They often come from a place that's below the surface and below what's visible. Everything that you do, everything we don't do as well is oftentimes a result of multiple factors operating and interacting in our subconscious. And these factors, even though they're below the surface, as you can see, they're accessible to us if we want to and when we want to. So the question that comes to mind for me is how often do we take the time to explore the motivations behind the pedagogical choices that we make? Is this a practice we regularly do as individuals? Is this something typically done in language programs as instructional teams? When I reflect on my personal experience in regards to at least the curricular choices that I, I make and I've made, I discovered that in the case of Khalina, I was greatly influenced by my previous experience as a teacher of Spanish. And in the case of literature, I know that as a teenager, I loved reading classic English literature in its abridged uh, versions in summertime. And I like reading literature in general. Um, I had kind of some sort of beliefs, but really it's when I started reading research related to this issue of using literature in the classroom, um, some connections started to happen between what I thought uh, in relation to curriculum and student engagement and new convictions started to emerge, especially around vocab acquisition. Now I know this, but before I didn't. And it's interesting because when I discuss with colleagues uh, and friends the issue of teachers' agency and its connection to curricular choices, um, they sometimes tell me, oh, you know, but um, teachers of Arabic are lazy, you know, they, they, they don't want to do anything out, outside of, uh, of the textbook. It's easy to remain in the comfort zone. Um, it's easy to follow the textbook page by page, right? I, I don't need to... Um, but I ask, is it true that all teachers are lazy and that we prefer using the same textbook used by the program next door? I personally don't think so. Research indicates that agency is more normative than exceptional. That some way or another, we practice agency in our teaching. And I also have to tell you that I do realize that this iceberg metaphor does not capture all the reasons uh, that promote or hinder my agency. Uh, as a teacher. Um, there are other factors that might be influencing that are not inside me or related to my experience. Um, but there is one thing in this metaphor that I want to talk about briefly, and that is fear. As you know, fear can come um, from many different places. It can come from within, from the classroom environment, from what we think our colleagues will say, from the academic structure within which we operate from so many different places. And it's really normal for, for fear to kick in at some point in our professional lives. Um, I might doubt myself and say, oh, do I have the capacity or the authority to do this? And so um, maybe I'm not ready yet. Um, you know, this is my second year teaching Arabic. I, I need to first be able to master the textbook and teach well the textbook. Or what if uh, students go to this very famous intensive summer program and then I'm unable to fit them back in my classes and in my program? Let, let me stick to this textbook for now. It's, it's better, um, I'm, it's safer, right? Or what if students don't respond well to the text I wanna bring to class, to this topic? You know, there's something really hot happening this day in the Arab world. Um, maybe it's too controversial and I get in trouble. Um, 
or what will my administrators say if they discover that I'm not following the textbook page by page? These are all very legitimate thoughts and we've all had them at one point or another. I definitely did. I still definitely do as well. The research shows that when it comes to curricular choices, teachers often fear um, not being able to cover all the content of that's, you know, mandated, that's in the textbook. And I hear that all the time in workshops. And if you're losing control of the classroom, because we don't know where, where, where direction the conversation is going to go. And sometimes we fear not knowing how to respond to unexpected questions or reactions in class. I had once a student um, uh, in class back at the University of Texas that left my class, left my class in, uh, in the middle of the class crying because of a text that I had brought, up, brought to class. I reused that text later on many times, but the approach is different. But this is the extent to which things can happen in class. What do I do if someone starts crying in class because of the text that I brought, right? Harold Leon, which is this slide in, in blue you see below, who is an expert in medical education, says that sometimes it really boils down to fear of dealing with feelings inside of the classroom. My own feelings as a teacher and students' feelings. And the sad reality, for me at least, is that when we opt for suppressing our agency, what happens is that I keep bringing texts that I know don't work very well, and I've been guilty of this. We avoid topics that have the potential of engaging students because we don't want messy conversations. We don't want to get into trouble. We fail to conversations um, and therefore we fail to build real communities in the classroom. And when we refrain from showing this kind of humanity, we're choosing not to practice vulnerability. And this is the last point we, um, that I wanna talk about. Um, I think it's in vulnerability where we find some answer to the question of um, how can I come over fear? How can I overcome um, fear? Again, Merriam Webster defines um, what vulnerable means. Um, I think it's an important quality to have in our profession and in life in general. I'm not going to attempt to offer a formal definition of vulnerability in the classroom or in education, but I know that showing vulnerability in the classroom means that I'm gonna have meaningful conversations with my Arabic students, not only conversations about vocab and grammar. And I personally think that we spend too many hours with our students over a semester. So we'd better you know, engage in meaningful conversations with them. When I bring vulnerability to the classroom, it also means that I can be real to my students. I can show my person, my personality. I can show my humanity. I'm not a simple embodiment of the curriculum anymore because teachers are real human beings as well, right? And therefore, um, if I do this, then um, I have to accept my imperfections as a human being and as a teacher. In the case of curricular choices, it means that if I bring a textbook to class and it doesn't work well, but that's fine. I, I, can, I can laugh over that. I can consult with my students why it didn't work. I reflect on the experience after class um, so I can see if I can change anything um, for next time. So in this sense, vulnerability means um, not being afraid of making mistakes. Um, and this is something we tell our students oftentimes, right? But you, you shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes in class. And, but are we afraid of making mistakes as teachers as well? Um, being vulnerable means also that if I'm open to them, I trust them. I, I should trust them. I should trust myself as well. Um, whether things go well or don't go well, nothing bad will happen. And last, lastly, um, it's about taking risks. And again, we tell our students, you should take more risks in your essay. You know, I only see vocab that's from the vocab list. Why don't you try to bring something different? Well, we sh as teachers as well, maybe should take risks in class. We know that in education, in the field of education, and this has been uh, written about extensively, um, agency and risk taking are directly linked to innovation and creativity. 
When I read the first time the second paragraph you see in blue here in the blue box by um, an education expert called Yong Zhao, I thought, is he talking about Arabic language programs? Because this sounds too familiar to me. Teaching at the same pace, in the same sequence, using the same textbooks for all students, standardized tests. I mean, that it was a little bit suspicious, right? So we need to know that teacher agency plays a very, very important role in educational change, whatever the discipline is. Last but not least, we know that teacher agency is also directly linked to the well-being and self-confidence that teachers display in class. If I'm able to exercise my agency, I feel competent. And this feeling of competence generates an intrinsic motivation to keep learning, to improving my instruction, to growing as a professional, which is something we all need. And we all practice in a way or another. But the more agency we perform, the more intrinsic motivation we will have to keep going in this field and to keep adding to the field, to our students, to our colleagues. And, um, as I said, I think most teachers want, want to learn and, and we do that. We all, we're constantly attending workshops and, and conferences and, and so on. So how can we incorporate the different concepts I brought in today, like agency, vulnerability, well-being, growth, not only in our daily practice and in the classroom, but also in teacher education, in workshops, in MA programs, if, and when I reimagine the landscape of Arabic teacher education, um, I really think that we need to do more serious and systematic curricular analysis and design. Um, this is something uh, that lately we've seen a few PhDs uh, dissertations about, and, and that's, that's very necessary, but we need to do more of that. I think we also need to discuss what it means to design proficiency-based language programs in Arabic and for Arabic. What does proficiency mean again? We also think would benefit a lot if we talked more about the psychology of teaching and the psychology of learning. I find this missing a little bit. And then uh, we have communities of learning. Russia shared a lot of uh, platform and, and platforms and spaces where teachers interact and exchange uh, great ideas. Um, but we need also to meet more often to co-construct knowledge together. It's, this, is, this can be an individual job, but it's much more fruitful if we do it as a group of practitioners. Again, we need to, 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 to be engaged in more systematic self-reflection, as I said early on. And last but not least, I think we need to treat teachers that come to our workshops and training programs, not as technicians, but as people and professionals who bring their own experiences, their own knowledge, and their own professional aspirations, right? Um, I think we're really in a good moment in the field in the sense that, and I think the pandemic has contributed to that. It's been said over and over uh, yesterday. And I've said that in the past, I think it has given, this pause has given us a moment to reflect on what we do uh, in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, so I'm optimistic in that sense. Uh, we're coming to the end. Um, if you, are interested in the concept of uh, teacher agency, um, I want to invite you to uh, participate in a very brief survey that my colleague Geria Atanasova and I have designed. We are looking um, at this uh, concept. I think this is the first time it's been looked at um, in, in research. Um, and we want to know how do you understand the concept of teacher agency? Today, I referred mainly to curricular choices, but you all know that agency can have many different meanings and it can resonate in different um, places depending on who you are. Um, do you feel that you exercise agency in the classroom? If yes, and if no, what do you think are the reasons for that? I'm going to share now um, a link over the chat after the um, 
conference if you have some time and if you're interested. What we're looking at now is to collect a group of diverse people with whom we can meet in a focus group so we can hear from them, take note. And based on that conversation, we're going to design a survey that we are going to distribute to um, globally to our colleagues in any country and everywhere. Um, so we can share with you back, you know, some data, maybe some recommendations. And um, that's all I have for today. Thank you um, very much for choosing to be this morning with me. And um, please connect if you'd like to say anything in relation to this topic, if you have any thoughts. I'm gonna unshare my um, screen now so I can share with you the link over the chat. Let me copy this here. And thank you very much again for listening. Thank you so much, Shalayla. Uh, I mean, what an amazingly inspiring uh, keynote speech for us this morning. Um, you made my job as chair very easy by sticking to the time. So thank you very much. Um, definitely your talk resonated with me and I'm sure with all the participants looking at the comments, it seems that many, many of the points did resonate. So thank you for that. Um, I think we need to uh, take some questions. Um, just checking the uh, questions we have. Um, okay, this is a question from Yuri. Uh, he, uh, he says, I very much believe in the issue of agency, and sadly, I find that remote learning hinders the ability to fully engage with students in a manner that enables agency. What are your thoughts on this? Do you mean only uh, students' agency or teachers' agency? Um, that enables agency. I'm not sure. I very much believe okay. in the issue of agency and remote learning hinders the ability to engage with students. Or he just said students' agency. Awesome. Both, yeah. I guess student agency maybe then. Yeah. I actually, yeah, I actually think, um, I actually think that Okay, so everyone has has experienced challenges with online teaching, right? And including myself. I, I I I was lucky that the first semester that the pandemic hit, I was not teaching, so I had the opportunity to learn from a lot of people. Um, but I think if you typically give agency to students uh, in a face-to-face -face environment, why not give it to them as well when you're online? I think. If we're talking about students' agency, we would need to think of, first of all, how do I give agency to my students when I'm in a classroom? Um, agency can, can look very differently. The purpose of e agent, student agency, in my opinion, is that students can um, take charge of their own learning with my help as a teacher. I do believe that when a student comes to my class, he's in principle interested in Arabic, right? Uh, I, I, I understand that there are programs that or universities where language is enforced on everyone. You have to take one foreign language. I'm not talking about that kind of situation, but even in this kind of situation, I also ask myself, well, if, if the student picked Arabic, why they didn't pick Chinese or French, right? So I think that in that sense, it's, it's my job in a way to provide um, an exciting environment in class and interesting materials based on students' interest. Um, so what I said is ask your students at the beginning of the semester, why are they here? Why they're taking your class? What do they wanna learn? When they leave the class, what are the things they wanted to be knowledgeable about? Is it the language? Is it culture? Is it a dialect? Whatever it is. I think agency can be promoted um, offline uh, and online as well. I've, I've learned um, to use breakout rooms. If you use Zoom, I mean, I don't know other platforms, but Zoom is amazing in that it gives me the opportunity to use uh, breakout rooms. And I don't have to be on top of my students to know what they're exactly doing. I can give them a lot of agency if I give them options. I think the trick is give me options and I'll show you what I can do. 
but give me options, please. If you put me in a specific, in a constrained context, in a constrained text, in a specific curriculum, um, I think less and less agency is going to be left out for students and teachers. So mm -hmm. I don't have a straight answer, Uri. I think it's an important question that we ask ourselves, but it has to do a lot with the nature of my class, the nature of my program, um, why we're taking Arabic, why I'm teaching Arabic, what do students want to get out of it? it it's a complex situation, as I said before. I, it's um, it's tricky. Yeah. And it's perhaps thank you for the question. more important to, to try and convey it online. Because if it's about technology and how to use technology, that's easy fix. If it's about imagining the classroom and it's more of a philosophical question i think we really need to engage into discussions sure um i will try and get through as many questions i'm seeing many many questions coming in so clearly um there's lots of interest here but we have three minutes left for questions so mm. let's uh, try and get through as many as we can so another question um says what about the students who have se uh, sequential minds they learn through rigid structure. Is there room for them in the student agency model? I'm not sure. I've never read uh, that students have sequential minds. Um, I also don't believe much in the concept of different learning styles. There is a very good book that's called Psychology in the Classroom by Routledge, published a couple of years ago. And they debunk the idea that um, there are different learning styles. There are good practices and stuff that works when we learn. That's why I said we need to talk more about what it means, like what, what psychology means when learning a second language. So I'm afraid I don't believe in the concept of sequential mind. I think we have different preferences, but I also think that if the practice has been researched and it, 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 there is proof that it works in class, it should work for most people. Uh, I'm the kind of person who always were, you know, I, I always hated the idea of flashcards. When I, whenever I saw a student that has flashcards and I thought to myself, why are they having flashcards? They, they're learning Arabic that way. You know what, guess what? I have my own Japanese flashcards now because I'm, I'm learning a language that use ideograms and I need the flashcards and I never thought myself needing this. So I don't think there's something that um, is called, you know, what do you call it? Sequential mind. I think there are, there are techniques that can help you at some stage of your learning process and some other techniques that can work in a different context. It depends on what you're teaching. But again, that's why we need to, to, to enact principled, informed agency. Um, let's read the research on what they say about it. And then let's, let's have an idea about our students before judging them. Sure. Um, I think we, I'm not sure if we have time for another question or... Yeah, you could you could do another question and then we'll go into the break. I'll do the next question on the list then. And then I realize that there's um, other questions that won't have been answered. So please feel free to uh, contact uh, Leila directly with your questions. Yeah. Leila, I'm sure you're happy to answer mm -hmm. those. For Absolutely. People. Um, so um, Hanin Ibrahim um, says that you rightly pointed out the importance of convincing colleagues of the importance of change. How have you managed to convince colleagues working with you of the importance of implementing change? How can you deal with resistance in the environment around you, such as colleagues and administration? Mm -hmm. I think you, we cannot change anyone. And I don't think we're here to change anyone. Um, I think you can, you can talk about uh, what you're doing, different things you've tried in the classroom, whether they work or not. Um, but it's very difficult to convince people. Uh, and I don't think it's our job. Um, that's why I think we need to rethink the way we give teacher training. I believe very much in the co-construction of knowledge. If we meet as communities of practice that are interested in the same thing as teachers of Arabic that believe in X and Y and Z, whatever it is, and we, we, we won't agree. There are different paths to teaching. I always say, when people ask, should I start with uh, dialect or MSI? I say, you know, 
all paths, all roads will lead you to Rome. Just make it enjoyable, please. Don't, don't make it hard on yourself and on students. So I think it's about dialogue. We need to talk more about what works for us and reconstruct the knowledge that we have, the preconceptions that we have about the teaching of Arabic. Um, I think without dialogue and without being open to possibilities and new options, it's very difficult. I think if, if I wanted to say something, we should practice more flexibility ourselves as well. Thank you, Leila. I think that's a question that's probably on most of our minds. Um, I, I do apologize to everybody who sent a question. Uh, we simply have too many questions, not enough time, but please do uh, contact Leila directly with your questions. Um, thank I'm you. I'm gonna read them too. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Leila. Again, uh, really interesting, thought-provoking um, uh, talk that resonated with us from, you know, you'll see the comments and the questions. Um, it, you know, it, it, it was really wonderful to hear. Thank you.